Welcome to CyberBytes Foundation's Week 3 of Cyber Chats. For October Cybersecurity Awareness Month, we are having discussions and presentations around our three core missions, education, innovation, and outreach. I encourage you to check out our previous videos where we highlight the students that have attended our STEM-based summer camps around programming, drones, 3D printing, and of course, cybersecurity. We interview our successful students that have attended our latest Security Plus boot camp and successfully passed the certification exam. One of those successful students and newly minted Security Plus member, Steph Miller, is also a CyberBytes staff member and this week has created a presentation on data analytics and programming with R. CyberBytes Foundation's Week 3 of Cyber Chats. For October Cybersecurity Awareness Month, we are having discussions and presentations around our three core missions, education, innovation, and outreach. I encourage you to check out our previous videos where we highlight the students that have attended our STEM-based summer camps around programming, drones, 3D printing, and of course, cybersecurity. We interview our successful students that have attended our latest Security Plus boot camp and successfully passed the certification exam. One of those successful students and newly minted Security Plus member Steph Miller is also a CyberBytes staff member and this week has created a presentation on data analytics and programming with R. For our next chat, here is Steph with data analytics and programming with R. Hi, my name is Stephanie and I'm going to be giving you all a brief introduction to programming with R. So let's start with what is R. R is a programming language developed in 1993 as a solution to the end of life uh, programming language S. Uh, it's a language mainly for data analytics and visualizations and it's kind of known for being an open source SAS. SAS standing for Statistical Analysis System. Um, it's very popular, very widely used. It's super well integrated. Um, you can use it to do machine learning. You can use it with Google's TensorFlow. You can use it with C++. You can use it with Java. You can use it with Python. You can just use R all the time. Uh, it's super reproducible um, in part because you can really integrate it in with Markdown to create R Markdown documents, which are nice text documents that show code and the output from the console to really give an idea of how you reached your results. You can also use it with Jupyter, which is another program that allows you to put interactive code into your documents so that you can see the code update with real time. and super great for web pages. So R has kind of like a five-step process that starts with identifying the area, um, getting the data, then you want to transform that data, run your analysis, kind of make hypotheses, change them, change them as your uh, path changes to then create a model that you can share and communicate with others. You can install R for free from the Comprehensive R Archive Network, also known as CRAN. Uh, CRAN is the main source for hosting R libraries and packages. There's currently over 16,000. R is really known for its super active user base that is always contributing to the language. R is also mainly used with R Studio, uh, which is an IDE or an integrated development environment, which is just a GUI for programming. It's really nice to be able to see your data on the screen and to be able to see your console and do the data live, do the coding live. So I think that's why people really like it. Some of the more popular packages for R are Tidyverse, dplyr, and ggplot. Uh, ggplot's really what's going to create most of the figures with that you see that are being made using R. And then Tidyverse and dplyr are for data transformation. They have like aggregate functions, some mean, and really good stuff like that. So for the exercises I'm going to be showing you guys, I'm going to do Hello World, which is everybody's first program essentially. And then we're going to be getting data from the Bureau of Labor and Statistics. 
to map unemployment across the states to show a line graph of unemployment from 2018 to 2020, and then also show the job market's growth using projected employment. And then I'm going to put all that into an R markdown and show you what that can look like. All right, so for the first exercise, we're going to be doing hello world. Um, we're going to be making a string hello world and assigning it to the variable my string. Now, R uses the arrow for assignment. I think it's a legacy thing left over from S, but if you look in the documentation, it has a higher precedence than the equal sign, so that's why most people use it. We print the string right here in the console. You get hello world. You can see in our environment, this is where our variables are stored, and it will give you the value of them as well. So these are some libraries we're going to be using. We need ggplot for plotting. The grids make the background. Dpliers for data transformation. The BLS scraper is what's actually getting us the information from the website. And the US map is giving us the actual coordinates for plotting the lines of the map. Now we're getting our information from the Labor and Statistics website. Um, it's by county. I'm not sure that they have it by state, but we're going to do that. All right, so now that we have our data, we want to go ahead and look at it. It's really good practice to just look at kind of what you're working with. So you see here, this is kind of what our table might look like. And if you want to as well, you can go up into the environment and with something like this, you can click here. It'll show you what each column is and the data type. So. It's taking a second to load, but I know that the unemployment rate is actually stored as a character and not a number. And so that's going to make it pretty hard to plot. So part of our data transformation, what we want to do is to set that as a numeric value. Um, we also want to get just the state since we don't want to have this county title right here. We just want this state. Um, it'll just make it easier for later. So we're going to go ahead and cut those characters out using the substring function. And then to get a state summary, what we're going to do is average the unemployment rate per county by the state. And then we are also going to sum the labor force, the number of people employed, and the number of people unemployed. And make a brand new table called unemployment state summary. So if we were to look at that, we would have some nice data, really good for plotting to a map. You can see here we have our states, the unemployment rate, and our other valuable variables right here. Now, because we want to have a nice gradient that is evenly cut and distributed on the map, we are going to make those breaks using the rate D variable that we are creating here. Um, and it's just going to classify the unemployment rate a little bit nicer. So if we go ahead and look, now we can see these are how the states fill or the color of the states will be classified. So the next thing we need to do is get the state boundaries for our map. So that's where the US map library comes in. So we can just grab those. If we look at that data, we can see that we have an x coordinate, which is our longitude, our y coordinate, which is our latitude, um, the FIPS, which is the code, the abbreviation, and the state, in the order that they need to be plotted in. Um, just to make this process a little bit easier, we're going to go ahead and rename our columns so that we know, um, mainly because you need an ID for, uh, column to use the maps. So now you can see our columns are nicely named. So to plot our map, we're going to be using ggplot. Now ggplot works in layers. Um, this layer right here is just our plain map. So if we were to comment out everything else, you 
you would see just a blank map over here. Um, you can use the zoom function to get a better idea of what your map actually looks like. If you want to save the figure, you can save it here. And there's also a way to do that right in the code. So this layer is going to be our um, unemployment data that's actually put on. The scale fill brewer just makes a nice gradient of colors. These are just different effects for the um, X and Y axes. So if we go ahead and plot everything, this is what the unemployment rate by state looks like. And here you can see why we did the breaks. We can have nice discernible colors within the states. All right, so now let's go ahead and take a look at the unemployment rate, once again using the BLS scraper. So we now have that. Let's just go ahead and click on it here. You can see that this is the unemployment rate as of September 2020, so this is even more accurate than the unemployment per, per county. We have our value and the series ID of where they pulled this information from from their website. These just correspond to the months, obviously, period, period name. So one of the things that I wanted to do is just get rid of the M in the period. We know what month it is, um, which we can use that for some string manipulation. Um, one of the really great things about R is you can set the importance of the axis, what you're using to label the axis, so those would be your factors. Um, we want the months to be in order. It already, the base R knows month names and how to recognize them, so we can go ahead and make that a factor. And then we also want to be able to group them together in importance based on their year, so we will go ahead and factor that as well. And as you can see, it doesn't look any different. But that's because it's putting that in the background so when we plot, it knows what to look for. So now when we plot this, you can see the unemployment rate for 2018, 2019, and 2020. You can see that in 2019, the unemployment rate fell by just a little bit. But then in March of 2020, due to COVID, we have a huge spike. Um, so I think that's just kind of fun to look at. So now to save some time, we're going to look at maybe the future of employment. Um, this was taken from the BLS website on their employment predictions from 2019 to 2029. Um, I'm using an Excel sheet just to save some time. So this Excel spreadsheet, as you can see, has multiple tables in it. This is an index, really nice and linkable. Um, if you want to click on it. A lot of information here about employment projections, but what we're going to be using is just table 1.1, which is uh, employment by major occupational group, and then also 1.2, which has more details. Um, you could think about this just as like the actual job titles within the categories of the first group. All right, so we need the read Excel function to be able to read in the XLX, um, SLX, LSX data. Um, and we need, we're going to set that using the Excel sheet function into sheet names because this is going to give us the index, the table 1, table 1.2. If we were to just read it in as is in Excel sheets, we would not be able to get every single sheet. Um, that's why to do that, we're going to use LApply to uh, apply that function to the specific sheet here using our path. Oops. And then if you can see here, we have a list. Um, when you click on it, this is a list within a list. So now you can see all the different characteristics that come in there. So to be make that a little bit more usable, we are going to select that list and save it back in the same number, let's get table 1.2. So if we are looking at this table, even though it looks all nice and pretty in Excel, 
you can see that it doesn't group the same way in R. We have a lot of NAs here, which isn't good. Um, we don't have any table column names. Um, so we're going to go ahead and fix that and just name them how we want them. So, And you could always just kind of like look back um, to get the names. If you want to look at the data, you can see that this is the title. This is employment for 2019, 2020. It kind of gets compressed down when you read it in an R. Now this right here is a really cool function to get rid of all those NA values. It makes the data super usable. Um, let's go ahead and get rid of the second row because we don't want total occupations. That's going to mess up our numbers. And once again, as before, the actual numbers are stored as characters. So we want to get those as numbers. Now, to plot the projections of 2019's employment versus 2029's, we are going to first get just the top five. There's 23 observations. That would make a lot of bars, so we just want to see what the top groups are that are going to have the biggest job growth. So we can use our order function to do that in descending order, and then we're going to select the top five. Now, R has a really great function, or library that will help you do this kind of analysis by using melt. So what it's going to do is it's going to take these two columns and kind of add them together so that we only need to plot one column with two variables, two different variable names, if that makes sense. Um, so that's where it will preserve the occupational group and map those onto the values for these two. Um, and because the names are just long, we're going to get rid of the occupations at the end and replace the end in the middle with a slash. So everything's a little bit neater and more concise. So when we plot that, you can see that the top five areas of job growth are in community and social service, computer and mathematical occupations, healthcare, healthcare support, and personal care. So now switching gears into more of the actual job types, let's figure out what the actual jobs that have the biggest um, job growth are. So same deal, we're just going to rename all of our column names, um, get rid of those total occupation rows. Now these are just NA rows um, that you can look at and find in the data, but instead of using that tidy function, I just hard coded it. Um, and once again, get all of our numbers. Now, if you look at our data, which is always important, you should be looking is this one. You will see that we also have a total occupation here. And you can see that when we look at the data type um, column that we do have summary values in there. We don't want those because we're trying to find actual occupation that would be under line item. So we can go ahead and get rid of those using the which function. This will give us a matrix of every single row that contains a summary value. And then we're just going to remove those. All right, so now we are going to order our top jobs and then subset that into a list of 10 and plot it. Um, we flip the coordinates here because there are long names. We don't want it to cramp up the bottom. Um, we set our scale, you know, got everything going. So when you zoom in, you can see that we have wind service, wind turbine service technicians, statisticians, physicians, what I find personally interesting, information security analysts, shout out ACL, and... Um, you know, nurse practitioners, therapy, home health care, we kind of expected to see that um, as part of that personal care, health care, but, and then the physicians, this all kind of falls into the computer category as well. So one of the things that's really cool about R is its ability to seamlessly integrate in with the markdown. So I already created an R markdown document that for you guys to look at. Um, this is what it would look like. So if you code a file up here and you create a 
new file, you have the option of creating an R script or an R markdown or even a shiny web app. Um, this is what you would be using to create a nice HTML web page. It'll give you this header so you don't have to worry about that. Markdown is super easy to use. Um, you just, these, the hashes kind of create headers or bold text. You use your text and then you can insert our code right here. So what makes it cool is you can run it right here to also test your, uh, to test your code and to have it be input. And then if you want to make it into an actual HTML page or a PDF or something to send to somebody, you can actually do that. And so then if you wanted to say share this, put it on a website, you can see here that this is our, our notebook. We have our hello world exercise. We have our introduction to R what the output is. You can see here, you can even scroll through the information. You can use links. So I put a link in here to the BLS scraper library that we use. So really easy to make really great interactive documents. Um, and that's how you do a little bit of programming in R. So I hope you guys learned a lot or are inspired to maybe try some of that on your own time, do some data analytics. Thank you. Next is AJ Orr and my discussion on the state of cybersecurity and reaching non-technical small business owners. Thank you everyone for joining us on our next Cyber Chats here at the CyberWites Foundation. I'm pleased to introduce AJ Orr with Simple Plan IT out of Columbus, Ohio. AJ is a cybersecurity professional, retired Army, and I'm glad he's able to take the time to chat with us today. Thanks, AJ. Hey, thanks for the introduction, John, and uh, thanks for the opportunity. Um, as John said, my name is AJ Orr. I'm the founder and CEO of Simple Plan IT. I'm also a military veteran. Um, and over at Simple Plan IT, we specialize in helping small businesses to understand and manage their digital risk uh, by providing them with simple solutions to help them protect themselves from the things that they don't see coming. Awesome. Awesome. Right now, what do you see as some of the biggest challenges, you know, with small business getting I'll call it on board the cybersecurity train to be able to go, hey, we actually have a problem here. We need to start filling the gaps. How are, how are you approaching that with them? So I, I would say the biggest issue that faces small businesses when it comes to cybersecurity is really just the mindset. Uh, it, it, it all starts with there and, and the at the top, having the culture uh, and building a cybersecurity minded or security minded culture um, and also, you know, working to change the, the narrative when it comes to cybersecurity. You know, most business leaders and most people in general hear the word cybersecurity and they automatically think IT. They think it's something that my IT department handles, my IT company, it's something technology related. And while that is one part of the equation, the other half of the equation is, is the digital risk to your business and it's the people aspect. So what are your policies? What are your procedures? What is the culture of your business and how it relates to cybersecurity and really protecting your digital assets? And so it's kind of changing that narrative and changing the conversation away from, you know, cybersecurity, so to speak, and really looking at it as a digital risk management function of your business. Uh, how are you protecting your digital assets? And when we talk about digital assets, we're talking about uh, your intellectual property, your financials, your identity, your employees' identities, you know, all of those things. That's what the criminals are after. They're not after your computer system. They're after your information, which exists in a digital format. And you need to figure out where it exists within your organization, who has access to it, all of these different things. And once we can start to get them to wrap their head around that, then I think small businesses will be in a much better shape when it comes to cybersecurity, or as I say, digital risk management. How, how difficult has it been uh, either with COVID? Has that opened up more doors for with people working remotely to go, oh, wow, we've, we've not taken this as seriously as we should have, and now nobody can come to an office. H have you seen a, a different mind shift because of the situation that we're in now? I wish I could say yes, uh, but it's still more of the status quo. The, the, the issue is, is that everybody thinks they're, they're good until it happens to them. Uh, so it's one of those things of my IT guy has it. Yeah, we're all protected or or the best is, you know, we're too small to be a target. Uh, so, you know, do I really have to worry about it this much? And, you know, one of the things that, I, that you know, 
90% of everything that we do is education and trying to get people to understand what their risks are, what the vulnerabilities are and where they exist. Uh, and a big portion of that is understanding that, you know, most cyber attacks, they're not targeted attacks. It's not like you've got a hacker that's sitting there and saying, you know, I'm going to break into your company. Uh, you do have those out there, but those are, like you said, large organizations that, that they're targeting. But most cyber attacks are crimes of opportunity. It's because, hey, they wrote this script that's going out and looking for vulnerabilities in, in these different devices. And if you're not staying on top of that, that's how they get in. Or somebody clicks on something that they shouldn't have clicked on. They get key loggers loaded on their machines, you know, and, and that's how it happens. And so I, I think if, if more small business leaders understood really the psychology and what broke down and how cyber attacks actually happened and took place, I think it would help to shift that conversation to where they would take it a little bit more seriously. What's the, what, what do you see then trying to change that narrative so it's meeting people kind of where they're at? What's the, what do you think is the best approach to being able to, to do that, to shift that mindset for the ones that you got the owners that aren't necessarily technically minded? They, they've heard the term cybersecurity, but they see as, oh, this is way too expensive. But to, to meet them at, what do you see as the best approach to that? I think if we, if we attack it from the position of looking at cybersecurity in the two parts that I kind of laid out before, you've got the hardware aspect. So you do have an IT component. It's your hardware, the computer systems you use, how that's configured, how that's secured, what are your uh, security measures in, that you have in place as far as uh, detection and prevention and things of that nature. Uh, how are you staying top, on top of all your security patches and updates and things of that nature? That is a large component. But that is not the only component when it comes to cybersecurity. And I think if we start focusing a little bit more on the other component, which is the human element, you know, your staff, your policies and procedures, how are you executing things? How are you holding people accountable? What are you doing to change the, the narrative or the culture within your organization to be more security minded rather than just being so convenience minded? I think as a society, we've gotten into this convenience over convenience and speed. We want everything now. We need it now. And it's got to be fast. It's got to be quick. And we're so accustomed to that instant gratification or instant turnaround that we sidestep security. And if we if we just took half a second, I think that we could eliminate a lot more of these issues. And so, uh, you know, one of the things that I, I talk about to clients and, and, and individuals on a whole is, you know, when we look at it, you've got businesses that spend thousands and sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars in technology solutions to secure their business. But we fail to realize or fail to address that over 90% of data breaches are attributed to human error. So why aren't we investing more time and resources into educating our people? Because that's a way bigger vulnerability than coming in and trying to brute force break into a hardened system. It's much easier for, as a criminal, if I was a criminal, it'd be much easier for me to trick somebody into doing something and giving me access because they're unaware of what they should or should not be doing than it is for me to try to penetrate and brute force break into your firewall that most organizations have in place and all the different security measures that they're putting in place. It's harder for me to break in that way. So I go through the path of least resistance as a criminal and it's going through your people. So we need to invest more time and resources into educating our people. And I think that'll, that, that's how you start to change that narrative. That's how you start to change the landscape uh, when it comes to securing your business and uh, you know taking that, that security over convenience culture mindset and making it penetrate the organization. Now, I know from my personal experience, when I have been a program manager of different government contracts, they would require us to go through security training typically once a year. You'd have to go through, uh, you know, maybe some of the rules and regulations as well as typical cyber hygiene. Hey, you've got your cat card, you've got your ID card, don't leave it on, the, you know, always take it with you, things of that nature. Um, part of me thinks that that's probably not frequent enough. Particularly when you're talking, you know, if you're working in this like you and I are, you know, we're in this day in and day out. So we have that mindset. You see something, you, you know, I, I feel naked if I don't have my badge with me. And then I go, oh, man, I left it in the car or I left it on my desk. But for those that may be an accountant or, you know, HR or marketing to to make it where it doesn't feel overwhelming and overbearing. How frequently do you think and, and to what depth level do you think? Uh, that training needs to occur as well as uh, to what depth, you know, how, how technical, how deep in does that need to go? So it's not, so it doesn't become just a resistance thing when you're trying to adjust the culture. 
I, I, that's a good question. Um, I, I think that uh, I think you're right that the once a year training is not enough. Um, and really, the reason why I say that and, and my approach isn't so much of we need to do so much do it frequently is looking at the psychology of how people learn. If I cover something once a year and I sit through a, you know, hour and a half, two hour lecture of these are all the do's and don'ts and things that you shouldn't do and all this, that and the other. Uh, well, you know, studies show from a psychology standpoint that we don't retain information well enough in order to actually execute against it in, in those type of formats. And so I think cybersecurity awareness training is something that you do if, if you're wanting to truly develop the culture. It's something that's continuous. It's something that you live and breathe. Like I said, it's easy for us because we live and breathe it every day. And I don't think that people need to get, uh, your employees do not need to get super technical and understand all the nuts and bolts like we do, John. Um, I, I think if an employee understands, hey, here are the threats and here are the tactics that criminals are using to get into businesses, this is what causes data breaches and really getting them to understand the psychology and, and how a data breach actually takes place. And, and giving it to them in small chunks, like, hey, this is how ransomware works, and this is what you can do to avoid it. This is what your company is doing to on the back end to try to protect itself, but here's your part. Here's how you can play a part. This is what you need to do. This is good email uh, email practices. You know, This is good web surfing practices. Hey, this is why two-factor two authentication is important. You know, just constantly reminding them on a, on a continual basis, whether, whether it be uh, through monthly micro trainings that I've seen out there and, and one of the things that we do, um, or if it's doing, you know, just quarterly trainings where they're just broken up smaller rather than trying to give everybody everything all at once, once a year so you can check a box. Uh, that's great. If all you want to do is check a box, then those, those scenarios work well for you. But if you really want to change the culture in your business, uh, do it more frequently. Like I said, at a bare minimum, once a quarter, you're diving into little things and you're not trying to give them the whole elephant at once. You're breaking it up into bite-sized pieces that are easy for them to understand, digest, and actually start to implement so that they can better protect themselves. Uh, and, and in turn, they'll do a better job protecting your business. Cool. cool. Now, and I absolutely agree with that. It's got to be very frequent, particularly when you're talking about trying to adjust a culture that may not have had anything in place at all. What, what do you recommend? You, you go through all the training to be acceptable accountability for this. You know, you don't want to get into a, a, totally a retribution type of thing. But if you were the weak link that caused ransomware to come in there and lock out your entire company because they weren't following the rules, what, how, what do you recommend as that process starts to begin to go, this, this is what needs to happen to make sure everyone's accountable to that, to, to the new culture and the security awareness mindset. So, so this is where your policies and procedures come into place. And this is where, uh, once again, cybersecurity is not just an IT function. It's a digital risk management function. And so you have to have good policies and procedures. Now you're talking about HR and working with your HR team to develop those, those policies and procedures that have clear outline consequences for different actions. You know, if you're caught not doing certain things, then this is the, the consequences or the penalties that go along with it. Uh, and that's how, that's how we kind of enforce those things to, to, to let people know that it's serious and that's how you it helps to engage the culture. Um, now, to make it so it's just not just a slap on the hand type of mentality uh, to where people are doing things out of fear, uh, you know, we've seen different things where there's some gamification to it. So with your cybersecurity awareness program, you know, uh, based upon how the, if you've got a good program where you're measuring metrics and you're seeing different things, uh, then you kind of gamify it. So for if everybody, you know, passes these quizzes or tests and does good jobs on the random audits and testing, then, you know, you can do pizza parties and things of that nature. Just make it fun, giving them an incentive to want to do these things. And like I said, uh, adding some sort of a gamification component to it, but then at the same time, also making sure that they're clear that they're, hey, there are consequences to this as well. Uh, and, and hammering all those things out with your HR department to get those good policies and procedures in place. And then just making sure that we're constantly talking about these things and clarifying, you know, hey, this is why this procedure is in place. This is why we do these policies, because these are the consequences. This is what could happen. And, you know, and share the numbers with them. I think that if, if people, if you want to be effective, you have to get buy-in from top to bottom. 
and you get buy-in by making people feel included and the more they understand hey we're just not doing this because we want to be uh that we want to make your life harder there are consequences as a business whole as to why we're doing these things and why we're putting these things in place uh and i think if if employees understand that a little bit more you'll get better adoption and that's how you start to change that culture slowly but surely awesome awesome now one of the things that i know i had struggled with in talking with people that sit there and go and you mentioned it earlier I'm not a target. We're too small. You know, there's no way. And, and again, stuff that I had seen was similar to what you had mentioned. You know, somebody's out there running a port scanner. Oops, they picked you randomly and you had the vulnerability or they ran a script. And guess what? You had not run patches. I mean, I don't think that we go a day without even large organizations having some some level of that hitting the news. And as we were talking before we started the recording, I mean, I've seen numerous school systems being hit with ransomware attacks and things of that nature, which, of course, can be extremely costly to remediate. Are you actually going to pay the ransom to try to get the data unlocked to, to, get, to get the security key to unencrypt the, the packets and everything? Um, how do you how do you approach the, the the business owner that one still hasn't necessarily got it? That doesn't realize that, yes, you may not be a very specific target, but this is worth the return on investment for, for, the, for those that are just so stuck on this. This can't happen to me. Yeah, it can. How, how do you approach those conversations? So we open up those conversations really with the, the concept of risk management. You know, and, and it's all about mitigating risk. And so as we start to categorize things and, and paint the picture, you know, this, the numbers are what the numbers are. You know, and the numbers say that 60% of small businesses that suffer a data breach file for bankruptcy within six months after that event. And the reason for that is because data breaches are super expensive. You know, like, like you kind of pointed out with, with the previous example, you know, there are uh, remediation costs. You know, so do I pay the ransom? How, you know, if I don't pay the ransom, can I restore from backups? Well, there's lost productivity and there's a lot of downtime to getting all that taken care of. Then you've got to worry about are there any legal fees? Because, you know, if your data was compromised and it has an impact on others, you know, what kind of regulations are you beholden to where now you've got legal fees that are stacking up that you have to tend to? Um, and so there's all this stuff that pe all these ancillary things that people don't think about when it comes to a data breach that it makes it very expensive. And so, like I tell these, the business owner that says, well, I'm too small for this to be a target. The question that I didn't ask them is, okay, well, is it worth the risk of being part of the 60% that files for bankruptcy? Or could you afford if, you know, the, I, I think the last st statistic I saw was that the average data breach cost a, a small business roughly $149,000, $150,000. And that number will vary depending upon which statistic you look at. Uh, but even still on the low end, you know, do you have $130,000 that you could fork over and afford to lose? And if you don't, then it behooves you, if it, nothing else, to at least consider it as a possibility and look at what different security measures can you put in place to help mitigate that risk. Um, and so that, that's what I said. It's all about a digital risk management function, not a cybersecurity function. Uh, I think they, they, they coincide, but that narrative has to change. Uh, and if you're as a business leader, if you're not looking at, at cybersecurity as a digital risk management function of your business, then you're doing yourself a huge disservice. Absolutely. Shifting gears a little bit, but staying within the same frame, uh, same line of questioning, you know, we both have been tracking the cybersecurity maturity matrix certification, or excuse me, I probably get CMMC, that, that the Department of Defense is going to be implementing within the whole uh, defense industrial base. What's your initial impressions of implementing a regulation that's going to enforce small businesses to do that? And do you think that that would be an effective approach uh, kind of across everyone? Because at some point we all cross, there's no geographic boundaries with cybersecurity. Every, you know, you've got multiple business partners, supply chain, you're, you, you know, you may be at the top of the supply chain, you may be at the bottom, depending on who you're working with on a given project. What are your feelings and thoughts as far as that, those types of uh, laws and regulations coming down? So I like the idea of the CMMC um, because I thought that the rolling out the initial uh, regulation with DFARS uh, was was a little tough because they they were asking small businesses that may not need to meet all those super high requirements 
uh, because if you were a, let's say you were a landscaper that had a DOD contract, well, now you were beholden to these super high regulations that uh, you didn't have any sensitive data. So all of those, you know, meeting all those strict requirements uh, was a little overkill. So the the uh, spirit of the CMMC of, you know, tearing the, tearing the security requirements down to make them more uh, appropriate for the level of contract or the level of uh, access to sensitive information that you had made sense. Uh, so you weren't crushing these small businesses by making them meet these security regulations that they necessarily didn't have to have. Uh, so I like the idea. I like the spirit of it from that perspective. Um, as far as you know, the value of can a regulation uh, is it appropriate for a regulation to to push down these requirements? Um, I tell people to take a step back, you know, and, and I work with a lot of people in or a lot of uh, businesses in different regulated industries, whether it be HIPAA, uh, DFARS and things of that nature. And one of the things that they always get upset about, they're like, well, I don't understand why I have to meet all these super high regulations. I'm like, let's take a step back and actually understand what the regulation is trying to get you to do. And all the regulation is really trying to get you to do is to implement best practices. Because unfortunately, we as humans, we you know that if if there's not some I'm not going to do it you know it, because if it's not easy if it's not automated if there's any kind of challenge to it then nine times out of ten we're just not going to do it and so you have to have some sort of consequence in order to get people to do these things even though it's in the best interest of themselves you know of course having these security regulations in place helps to protect the country as a whole for those that have dod contracts and protecting that sensitive information um in in the hipaa world obviously protecting your medical information the pci world protecting your credit card information uh all of that is important but as business leaders and as business owners it's our responsibility to make sure that we're doing our due diligence to protect those people that have entrusted us with those assets those digital assets and once again, it's just understanding and making sure that we change that mindset of, you know, criminals aren't after our computer systems. They just use our computer systems to get to our digital assets. And so these regulations are just designed to say, hey, look, these are the best practices for protecting digital assets that you may or may not know. Uh, because you don't know what you don't know. You know, I've been in business since 2013 um, and I'm marginally good when it comes to, you know, managing the books. That's why I hire a CPA and, 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 and let them do all my tax stuff. I'm not staying on top of the tax code. It changes too quickly. Um, plus, I'm not interested. But from a cybersecurity standpoint, it's no different. The landscape and the digital and, and the digital fights that we're facing is changing rapidly. I mean, it's the fastest changing industry on the planet. And so if you're not doing stuff and changing, you know, having having somebody that's staying on top of all that, it's it's easy to fall behind. And so these regulations are there to help you put in at least the best practices so that you can give yourself the best best chance of not being a, a victim or a statistic. That's that's awesome. Well, I appreciate your time today. Um, is, what is the best way if people want to have follow up with you that they can reach out to you or Simple Plan IT for any assistance they need or reach out and say, say hello. Absolutely. So the easiest way, if you want to get hold of me, LinkedIn is always the best way. Uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm always trying to post tips and tricks and the latest news out there uh, just to keep people aware. Um, also check out our website, uh, www.simpleplanit.com. Uh, we've got active blog there where we're posting out content. Uh, and like I said, 90% of what we try to do is just educate people on, hey, look, let's change the narrative. Let's change the way in which you're looking at cybersecurity and, and really start looking at it from a digital risk management function for your organization. And if there's anything that we can do to help to assist you with that, we'd love to help. Awesome. AJ, really appreciate your time today and look forward to the next time we get together. Hey, I appreciate the opportunity, John. Thanks and uh, best wishes to everybody out there. And here is Glenn with Enclave on Zero Trust Networking and Operational Technology. So thank you for having us. Thank you for doing the video. And it's a pleasure to be working with you guys and the Cyberbytes Foundation. And we're uh, honored to be here with so many distinguished other companies. This is a great foundation and it's a great cause and we're glad to be part of it. So thank you. So Enclave is here to bring trust to communications and to the Quantico Cyber Hub. We were formed five years ago with a mission of protecting critical infrastructure. 
We've got a team of uh, professionals, experts in cybersecurity, enterprise-based systems. And as you can see, we have a rich history working with the defense community and the intelligence community and large enterprises on a global level. So we take a little bit of a different approach to cybersecurity. If we look at this slide, you can see quickly that there's a big problem as we bring operational technology into an IT world. This is the attack surface from the United States Department of Defense. And as you can see, there's two things that this tells you immediately. The first one is we're not going to solve this problem, problem protecting these attack surfaces with just a piece of software. It's a more complicated, difficult, legacy problem to deal with. Second of all, if we think about taking all the operational technologies in the world and putting them into an IT network that wasn't designed to handle them, we're only going to increase complexity, cost, and increase the risk to the enterprise and to the people serving it. If we look at the landscape globally, there are over 50 billion operational technology endpoints already connected and talking. And it's about to explode with the implementation of 5G and the mad scramble to build endpoints that are intelligent, sensors, medical devices, all connected to the network and to the internet. Every day, we're seeing more and more breaches. The problem is they're not just data breaches anymore. Facilities, power, water, medical devices, all incredibly vulnerable. And now we're not just talking about data, we're talking about lives. As we look historically at the data, we need to come to the harsh realization that we haven't improved our security posture since the internet happened. If we look, we're still over 200 days behind on finding malware and breaches and even longer to contain them. Our approach to solving the problem is different. We took a totally different angle. We looked at the same technologies that the Department of Defense and the intelligence community used to protect national security and took some of the best, eliminated some of the cost, and today we offer a zero trust secure communications platform that we can apply in multiple scenarios in an enterprise to protect operational technology, remote access, and mobile communications. Our solution is based on a trust framework. If you're familiar with the work at NIST, You'll know their Zero Trust Framework has been released recently, and if you look at it, it's going to look a lot like this. We created this five years ago when we patented our technology, and this is about trusting people, devices, systems that work inside the network, and the network communications themselves. We focused strongly on the communications and the devices. There are lots of ways to approach secure communications. We chose to do layer two over layer three tunneling. And we took what was traditionally used as a highly secure point-to-point -point system and turned it into a completely manageable, dynamic network platform that can be embedded in almost any device. Our solution has three basic components. We use commercial off-the-shelf hardware to deploy in an enterprise. That allows us to create networks. We have a management platform inside to manage those networks dynamically organize them logically if you want, and a DMS or discovery and monitoring system that runs inside the platform to track the communications of every endpoint inside. We track anomalous communications behavior and we work with other companies who have additional detection systems, integrate them into our platform and give them highly improved isolation and containment. So let's take a moment and look at where the converged enterprise infrastructure looks like today. Highly complex, layered, access control lists, digital certificates, policies, virtual private networks, software-defined networks, software-defined wide area networks. CIOs are faced with a big problem. Adding equipment, adding new modes of communication is only going to make this more complex and more difficult to defend. What if we could take this environment and take portions of it and move them into zero trust environments? By doing it, we can reduce the risk profile for the entire enterprise 
simplify the zero trust components and save money. So it seems a little counterintuitive to create multiple networks or multiple network segments that you might manage differently. But the reality is it simplifies the overhead. In many instances, there's no reason to treat certain use cases and operational technology specifically the same way we treat a laptop. Communications isn't dynamic, it's static, can be tracked, easy to isolate, behavior is easier to track. So for scenarios like HVAC systems, building automation systems, factory equipment, even medical devices inside of hospitals, it's easier to break them into pieces, secure them, simplify them, and reduce the cost of overhead. So a little while back, we were tested at the National Cyber Range in Orlando. We were invited by the Secretary of Defense's office, and this is an image of their commingled environment. There's a building, some users. In the center at the top, you see that we have control systems that manage the devices inside that building, all legacy devices. And remember, from our perspective, with our platform, age, operating system, manufacturer, protocol don't matter. So we protect legacy equipment as well as we protect new equipment, and there's no restrictions on any new innovations that you may want to bring to your enterprise network. So here we have two segments, the control systems and the operational technologies in the building that we absolutely want to communicate, but they're commingled with the IT systems and unfortunately open to the internet. To be tested, we went into this environment and we implemented a zero trust network for all the operational technologies. As you can see, there's two gateways, each creating a layer two over three tunnel, going to a bridging system, merged and provided with remote access. This network, after we implemented our platform, is invisible to the IT department and completely inaccessible from the internet. The attack surface is gone, but it operates the same way today as it did yesterday. The result of this is more than just improved protection. By simplifying the environment and eliminating digital certificates, access control lists, flattening networks, but making them accessible from anywhere to increase secure remote access, we can cut the enterprise costs by a third. Since introducing our platform, we've picked up quite a few fans. Federal government, state and local government, large integrators like Jacobs, MC Dean, Insight, all partners. We're even working with NIST, MITRE, and multiple federal agencies to implement our platform to protect unsecured assets in a multitude of use cases. The summary today, improved security, simplified management, savings. If we're gonna beat bad guys and we're gonna change the game because we have to change the game, we have a way to do that. These are just some of the people we're working with. We'd love the opportunity to work with you. If you'd like to see our systems, we're in the building, we're in the lab, and we're available to chat and demonstrate what we do anytime. Glenn, thanks for taking the time to come out today. We're very excited to have Question. Enclave here and implementing segmentation with our own network and the things that we're doing and also be a showcase for you as well. Absolutely. Uh, just a couple questions. How long does it take to, I don't want to use the term retrofit, but I'll use that term, to actually segment out a, a pretty large environment like some of the clients that, that you have? So there's some thinking that goes into this up front. Um, it, CIOs need to know what's on their network, so there's a discovery process that everybody needs to go through. We need to find what's there. Then we need to look and create a communications matrix and a catalog of all of those assets. Then we can create a new topology and drop our network in. Once we've got a new architecture, it's actually incredibly simple to deploy. Our gateways can get dropped in and take control of network segments. They'll automatically connect. They run across open ports in the enterprise infrastructure and can run across the internet. So once it's in place, the network lights up and you have a private, secure, zero trust network. Awesome. Is there any other field or industry that you think you have not penetrated yet or one you're looking at, and I'm gonna bring up one right now, is uh, a big thing is election security. Oh. And with the way those devices are set up, is that something that you 
see as a, a target for your devices because of what's been going on in the news and for years now. So we certainly have to worry about protecting the election and the election system. Um, we've, you know, the timing wasn't good for this election, mm -hmm. but the reality is we could place one of our gateways um, at every precinct, run a local network, and collect and connect everything there with all of the other precincts in the state, merge them into one closed network that would be invisible from the inter internet and inaccessible from the bad guys. But maybe next time. Awesome. Well, again, I appreciate it. No, thank you. Please check out Enclave next time you're out here at the Cyberwise Foundation. Thank you.